is more the David. Adonai roi lo echsar. Binoteshe yarbitseni ame menuchot yanachaleni. Navshi yishovei. Yanacheni vamaglet sedek lemaan shemo. Kam ki helech begit sol mavet. Lo irara ki atai madi. Shiftecha umishantecha hemayenach amuni. Ta'aroch lefanai shulchan. Neged Tzurirai Tishanta vashemen roshi Kusiri vaya Achto vachesed yirdifuni Koyame chayai Vishaviti Bivet Adonai לאורך ימים. I've chanted for you the words of our 23rd Psalm. When we are finding ourselves in need of comfort and consolation, we often turn to the psalmist in seeking peace. And so I ask you at this time to the, recite these words with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In the rising of the sun and in its going down, we will remember him. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we will remember him in the opening buds and in the rebirth of spring, we will remember him. In the blueness of sky and in the warmth of summer, we will remember him. In the rustling of leaves and in the beauty of autumn, we will remember him. In the beginning of the year and when it ends, we will remember him. When we are weary and in need of strength, we will remember him. And when we are lost, and sick at heart, we will remember him. When we have joys we yearn to share, we will remember him. So long as we live, he too will live, for he is now a part of us as we remember Bruce Ryder. To you, Debbie, to his children, Gabe, Daniel, Shannon, and also Bridget, to the grandchildren, AJ, Peyton, and Grayson, to his sisters, Lynn and Daryl, his brothers-in-law, Barry, Ronnie and Timothy, his sister-in-law, Susan, to his mother-in-law and father-in-law, Marty and Menka Oldenburg, to all the members of the family and so many dear and cherished friends, we've come together today to remember, but also to celebrate the life of your beloved Bruce. There are no adequate words with which to try to mitigate the pain or to console the inconsolable. And this is why we've come together in deepest despair. And we acknowledge that words are of little help. Perhaps our just being here expresses a sentiment which goes beyond words. His death leaves us devastated and sad at the thought of the unfinished years. And yet we must find consolation and the memories we cherish of Bruce. Bruce was born in 1954 
the youngest of three children born to Red and Cyril Ryder. Bruce, along with his parents and his sisters, grew up on Eastway in South Euclid. Lynn and Daryl, when your baby brother entered into this world, and you described it as if the prince was born. Your parents adored him, and your feelings about your little brother couldn't have been further apart. Lynn, you became like the second mama, so protected of Bruce, and you doted on him. While Daryl, well, Daryl, let's just say you were not thrilled that this little boy came into your family, taking the honors of being the baby away from you. But as you all grew in years, closer to adulthood, the bonds between the three of you became even stronger. Daryl and Lynn, you knew your brother to be a very athletic, intelligent, and oftentimes mischievous teen who developed into a man with very similar qualities. You remember that your brother was an avid bicyclist and that he was an excellent basketball player. And while he was extremely bright, you remarked that your brother did not always enjoy attending classes at Cleveland Heights High School. You both remember stories of how your brother would get into trouble with his Latin teacher, sometimes even getting paddled, and how Bruce would convince the high school maintenance man to write notes to get him out of class so he could help the staff mow the school's lawn. <laughs> your brother was certainly resourceful, and he was also quite funny, maybe even hilarious. In your adult years, there were so many moments and so many stories when Bruce would have you laughing out loud, like when he would drive with you and stop for directions, rolling down his window, and in a strong, proper British accent, he would ask the passerby, the pedestrian, where a certain building was, and then he'd follow it up immediately by saying in the same proper accent, and where are the houses of prostitution? <laughs> in your childhood years, and especially as adults, the three of you were always there for each other, supporting each other as siblings and as friends. Following his graduation from Cleveland Heights High School, Bruce matriculated to Boston University where he majored in business. His determination and smarts merited Bruce a coveted award in the area of marketing. This award was normally given to a senior. However, the award was presented to Bruce in his sophomore year. As I've mentioned, Bruce loved to ride his bicycle, and he sometimes would even ride from Boston to Cleveland and back again just for an extra adventure. Bruce graduated from Boston University, summa cum laude, and then returned home to Cleveland to join the family business, Riders Stop and Shop. While Bruce had worked in the family store as a boy over the years, he now had the opportunity to learn the business inside and out, and Bruce worked hard and he was diligent in always trying to improve the stores. He wanted to better them and make them more appealing. He was also instrumental in growing the three stores to seven stores. And that Shoregate store, that's the one that held a special spot in his heart. That store was his baby. As Bruce's best friend, Bobby Reiner, shared with me, Bruce was the most knowledgeable and the hardest working person per square inch in the grocery business. Now this Shoregate store was very special to Bruce for another reason, because it's here that he met Debbie Oldenburg. Debbie, in 1978, you were the head cashier at the Shoregate store, and Bruce asked you to join him for a dinner meeting to discuss a problem maybe at another store. And your mom kept warning you, are you sure he doesn't like you? And you're like, no, mom, this is just a business meeting. You came home from that first dinner date and you said to your mom, I think he likes me. So mom was right, and a courtship began. And about eight months after that first date, you found yourself, Debbie, sitting across from Bruce at a Chinese restaurant where you innocently opened your fortune cookie, which contained the following words. A short Jewish man with curly hair will propose. <laughs> and he did. You and Bruce were married on August 31st, 1980 at B'nai Yashurin by Rabbi Schwartz. And you made your first home in Pepper Pike. And while you both worked so hard, you also made time to have fun. 
You won numerous trips through the grocery store industry's reward system. Together you traveled to Switzerland and Australia and Italy, Scotland and more. These were wonderful times and created beautiful memories. And early into your marriage, Bruce decided that the two of you needed a tandem bicycle, a bicycle built for two. And this could not just be any old tandem, not one that you might see in a store. It had to be custom made to your exact height proportions. And in typical Bruce style, he explored the options and he researched it. And by the time the custom made tandem was complete and finally delivered to your home, Debbie, you were eight months pregnant with Gabe. <laughs> and so with great enthusiasm, Bruce got you and himself on the bicycle and the two of you pedaled from your home in Pepper Pike to your parents' home in Bedford. Debbie, it was the first and last time you ever got on that bicycle. <laughs> and then life changed. Bruce's heart grew even bigger as each child enter entered into the world. You welcomed Gabe and then Daniel. And when Shannon arrived, the Ryder family portrait felt complete. Debbie, we all know that you and all your friends here, everyone knows that Bruce was really one of a kind. We know he had his shtick, and he was a character, and he was unique. And Debbie, you know this too, all too well, and so do your children. For Shannon, Daniel, and Gabe, having Bruce Ryder as their father was an adventure. He was a big, loving, fun, sometimes unpredictable, and usually very predictable guy with all of his adventures that he'd drag you into. He taught each of his children how to swim. Daniel, you told me he would pick you up and throw you in the pool. And if it seemed like you were drowning, he would help you. He taught you how to drive. Shannon, you remember how he would take you to the metro parks. I'm sure he did this with your brothers as well. And on the snowiest days in the most messy section of the park where the plows had not yet been, he'd tell you to slam the gas pedal down, go as fast as you can, and lose control of the car because he wanted you to know how to handle it. And Gabe, for you and your brother and sister, he taught you all that you could pass for a child 12 and under at a movie theater even when you were starting to grow facial hair. <laughs> he taught all three of you that when you buy a car, be sure to have them throw in the rubber car mats or else you walk away. <laughs> and for his children, he taught you that you can never, ever have enough gear. Your dad was the gear guy. Whatever might come towards Cleveland or planet Earth, thunderstorm, snowstorm, monsoon, or perhaps even the next ice age, your dad was ready and more than happy to put on his sub-zero boots and jackets. He was always ready to set up his tent and his tackle box, always handy right by the door in case an emergency fishing expedition came about. And anything the three of you needed, this is what he was most enthusiastic about. Shannon, you have this sweet and funny memory of your dad helping you with a school assignment to build a small car out of a piece of fruit. No ordinary apple, banana, or orange would do. Your dad had to make it from a star fruit or the ugly fruit, anything odd. You said it turned out to be a disaster, the project, but he did it with all his heart and soul. And every summer, Shannon, when you were packing to go to overnight camp, your dad would insist on buying you the newest, top of the line, with all the bells and whistles, sleeping bag. Your other girlfriends would return each summer with the same old sleeping bag that they got from Walmart or Target. But each year, your dad had to get you the newest style from the best backpack and gear store. And Daniel, you spoke of your dad and said he was a guy who could challenge you. He could get you thinking about things. He's also the only one who just a couple of years ago when he went to visit you in New York, when that snowstorm hit, which they were calling the storm of the century, how happy was your dad about this? Cars were forbidden to be on the streets of Manhattan, but there you were with your dad, strolling through New York City. He was decked out in his blizzard gear, smoking a cigar. He was so happy. And Gabe, whether it's the earlier memories like the time the two of you were going to make a soapbox derby car together and it kind of became more his project than yours, to more recent years with your shared knowledge and passion for the food industry. There were many things that bonded the two of you together. 
And then, Gabe, you brought Bridget into the family. And your father welcomed her. Bridget, he liked you and he respected you. And when the two of you gave him his three grandchildren, AJ, Peyton, and Grayson, his heart was full and happy. And whenever your dad spoke of his grandchildren, it was done in such a gentle and loving manner. Shannon, Daniel, and Gabe, while your dad may not have been the most demonstrative person in showing his feelings and his affection, you never ever doubted how immensely he loved you. As your Aunt Daryl shared with me, she stated that your father bragged about his three kids. He raved about you every chance he got. The love and pride that he felt for you was enormous. Bruce was a collector, a collector of pens and watches and knives and hiking boots and tennis shoes and even fleece pullovers. But his most prized collection, all of you, his family, his friends, the love and joy that he had for his nieces and nephews, all of you so very special to him, and his nieces and nephews holding such a beautiful and special place in his heart, and also his brothers-in-law, the, the closeness, the friendship, and on top of that, with Barry as well, sharing in their, in their careers together as business partners, and while he was blessed with many great friends, we know his closest friend, Bobby, who has been his best buddy since the seventh grade. We know that Bobby mourns deeply as well. Bruce and Debbie and Bobby and Michelle, your family. And together, if you know Bobby, you know that Bruce and Bobby together could be a little, a little nuts. A little nuts, thank you. Sometimes they would pretend they were doctors. This was not when they were in seventh grade. This was much more recent. And they wouldn't be Dr. Reiner or Dr. Ryder, but they decided they were Dr. Reimer. And they would play jokes on each other, paging each other in public places, restaurants, calling for Dr. Reimer over the PA systems. And I'm sure there's a lot more as well. Bruce had yet another love, and that was his dog, Kramer. And when he would work half days on Sundays and Wednesdays, he would love spending those other half of the days walking Kramer in the park. I believe the family shared with me that Bruce saw the same people walking their dogs every Sunday and Wednesday. He never knew the names of the people. He just knew them by, that's George's owner, that's Fifi's owner. He knew all the dogs. Bruce enjoyed nature. And whether it was scuba diving in the Caribbean or fishing at the end of his street in what he referred to as Easton Ocean, he could be competitive as well, especially in his quest for making it into the Guinness Book of World's Records. He put together what he called the largest grapefruit stand, 40,000 grapefruit, and the longest hot dog adventure, 100 feet. His sister Lynn will be happy to share more about that story with you later. But Bruce was always one grape shoot, one grapefruit or one hot dog foot sh shy of making it into that book. You know, Debbie, when I asked you to share with me some words to describe Bruce and his character, the three first words you said were intelligent, witty, and playful. And with all his amazing and lovable qualities, it makes today even more painful and even more difficult to comprehend. In the first portion of the Torah, Bereshi, we are reminded of this epic story of the creation of the world. Each day comes to the end of the Torah, and the Torah says, Vayihi er, vayihi voker, yom echad. It was evening, it was morning the first day. And on the second day, vayihi er, vayihi voker, yom sheni. It's odd, it seems, that the Torah, this most read, most studied piece of literature in the history of the world. It seems peculiar that it states not once but six times, Vayihi era, Vayihi voker, it was evening and it was morning. So why does the Torah place evening before morning, darkness before light? I can only offer that all of us find ourselves in a place at times that are dark and we struggle and we flounder and we try so hard to find our way back into the light. 
and whether or not that place of darkness is a place we visit for a short time or for what seems to be an eternity. Sometimes our loved ones, tragically, are unable to move from darkness into light. And so as you, his family, and all of his friends, as we move today from this day that feels very dark, we pray into the light. We join together praying that Bruce's soul is now at peace. And we join with the sages of our people as we declare Zichron Livrach. May the memory of Bruce Ryder and the good deeds that he performed in the land of the living, may these always be for a blessing. Amen. Our tradition teaches us that words which come from the heart enter directly to the heart. I want to call on his children to speak from their heart. Sometimes when faced with the worst things in life, the good in people can really shine through. And the outpouring of support my family's received has been immense and almost overwhelming at times. And I'd really like to thank you all for that. As I've gone through life, I've learned the best people are the people with many layers to them. On the surface, my father could appear abrasive, opinionated, loud, obnoxious, with a strong personality. When I used to work at the store, I would introduce myself to new employees but not fully tell them who I was. As I gained their trust, I'd sit there and nod my head as they complained about my father. <laughs> and I didn't do this to be mean. I did this to get people's real opinion of him. But once they learned I was the owner's son, I just sit back and smirk at their shock, embarrassment, and extensive apologies. But that was my dad. He was a little rough around the edges. He could be misunderstood by how he cared deeply and how he had his own ideas of the right way to do things. He had a tough exterior, but not everyone took the effort to break through. If you took a chance to listen and you asked the right questions, you'd realize the passion and the knowledge he had. If it was something he loved and wanted to know about, he could tell you everything about it down to the smallest, minute detail. You want to know why he kept a certain beef in the store? He'd tell you how the calf was raised, the personality of the farmer that raised him, how the feed was grown that the cow ate, and ultimately, why the way it was shipped is the best method for beef to be shipped. Another passion he had was, was knives. Recently, my girlfriend was telling me she wanted to get a knife. I was like, oh, really? Let's call my dad. I called my dad, simply told him the knife Jordy was thinking about getting, and put the phone down on speaker. He went into a 20-minute rant about the different metals a knife could be, why you'd want a particular handle on in the knife, the different switches a knife can have, and the advantages of each, and even the different laws of each state she may be driving to with the knife, from Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, and Ohio. <sighs> he loved to tell and retell stories usually accompanied with his own big laughter and cough and clapping of hands. Raise your hand if you were blessed to hear the famed Latin Bowl story. More than once. <laughs> now keep him raised if you heard it at least five times. <laughs> Some of his favorite stories to tell were about our dog Kramer, as the cantor mentioned. Kramer was our family dog, but really, Kramer in a lot of ways was my father's dog. He loved to tell the story of how we first got Kramer. After the standard extensive research on breeds and breeders, we as a family, but mainly I mean he, chose a Gordon Setter as the right breed 
and the right breeder was the one that took our family several hours drive to get to. When we got to the breeder, there were many puppies running around and playing. And we're like, which one of these is ours? The breeder said, oh, yours, come this way. <laughs> we went to a separate room and the breeder opened a drawer. <laughs> And there was our dog. <laughs> Kramer was a reflection of my dad in some ways. He was his own kind of character of a dog. And to my father, the first way we got him, how we first got him explained a lot. And he loved to tell that, he loved to retell that story to anyone who'd listen. My dad was fun and he was incredibly funny. In a lot of ways, he was a kid at heart the same goofy, mischievous kid from Cleveland Heights with the huge Jufro. And I mean huge Jufro, like, <laughs> like that bit, you know. One time when my brother and I were young kids during the summer, my father took us to the toy store to get squirt guns. He bought us these little guns and he invited a bunch of our friends over. All the kids are running around and squirting each other with these little guns, like having a great time. And all of a sudden, my dad comes out with these two huge super soakers. <laughs> Just completely, like, soaks all of us. My dad was very loving. And if he did, even if he didn't always know the best way to show it. One year with Valentine's Day and my mother's birthday approaching a few weeks away, my mom asked my dad, what should we do for dinner? My dad got a little awkward and just said, oh, oh, oh. Sorry, I got, I, got, I got something I got to do. A few weeks later for my mom's birthday, my dad gave her a necklace that he'd secretly been going to Julie class for weeks to learn how to make. As amazing and romantic as that is, in true fashion my father, he wasn't just proud of making the necklace for her, but how all, el all the elderly women in the class loved him for it. <laughs> He was a protective father and always wanted the best for his children. When he was teaching my sister to drive, another driving story, I don't know, it's kind of interesting that another one came up, but you know. Yeah, I guess so, huh? Um, when he was teaching my sister to drive, he was looking forward to the next lesson of teaching her to parallel park. My sister said, but dad, parallel parking is no longer on the driving exam. In response to that, he simply said, I only have one daughter in this world and I'll be damned if she doesn't know how to parallel park. <laughs> And the lesson then ensued. My father was a character in the best possible way. He was the smartest person I knew and one of the funniest too. He was driven, hardworking, honest, caring, sentimental, and charming. As a close friend told me, not everyone got him, but for those who did, you couldn't help but love him and the artistry he wove. I can't possibly account for all the memories you have of my father, but I hope you're able to remember how he all made you feel. My brother had a business textbook in college, and apropos on the first page it read, Neon Mor Epice. In French that means, here lies who, born a man, a grocer died. To Bruce Howard Ryder, my father truly one of a kind. We take a moment of silence as we ask God to accept Bruce's soul. As you're able, I invite you to rise for the memorial prayer, El Male Rahamim. El male rachamim, shochen bamramim, 
am Semen und Hanechon Atach hat Kampfe Haschina, wenn man allot Kidoshim und Torim, Kesor Harakiam Asirim, et Nihishmat, Ben Hersch, Ben Isirjona Vishoshi, Shechalach Leolamo begann er den Tehemen und Hato, Ahanaba Harachamim, as die Rehu, bis Seiter Knafach Leolamim, Vititror, Bitror, Chaim, et Nishmato, Aronai, Hunachalato, Vianuach, Bishalom, Al Mishkavo, Vinomar, Amen. O merciful God who dwells on high, who is full of compassion, grant perfect rest beneath the shelter of your divine presence among the holy and pure, who shine as the brightness of the firmament. To our dear departed Bruce Ryder, who has gone now to his eternal home. May his soul be bound up in the bonds of eternal life and grant that his memory inspire all of us to noble and consecrated living. And to this we say, Amen. We join together now in the words of our Kaddish as we recite together. Yitkadal v'yitkadash shamei rabah b'alma divrach diritei b'amlich malchotei Bechayechon, Ovyomechon, Ovechaye, Tehol, Beit Israel, Bagala, Uvisman Kari, Vimru, Amen. Yehesh me Raba, Mevarach, Leolam, Olame, Almaya, Yet Barach, Vietabach, Viet Paar, Viet Romam, Viet Nase, Viet Hadar, Viet Ale, Viet Alal, Shme de Kudisha, Brihu, Leela, Min Kol Birchata, Vishirata, Tushbechata, Venechemata, Damiran, Vialma, Vimru, Amen. Yehe Shlama Raba, Min Shemaya, Vichayim, Alenu, Vialkol Yisrael, Vimru, Amen. O se Shalom, Vimromav, Huya, a se Shalom, Alenu, Vialkol Yisrael, Vimru, Amen. We pray that God, who makes peace in a high place, will send peace and comfort to you, the mourners, to Israel, and to all humankind. Amen. Please be seated. I've been asked to share with you that the family will see, receive friends at Point East in their reception room. That's at 27500 Cedar Road in Beechwood until 8 p.m. this evening. Anyone wishing to make a contribution in memory of Bruce the family has suggested that you consider the American Cancer Society or, of course, a charity of your choice. On behalf of the family, we thank you for your love and support today.